Good evening, everyone. I'm Arielle Cates. I'm the Director of Programming at Village Preservation, and I'm so glad that you all are here with us this evening. Um, just a quick bit about Village Preservation. We have been documenting, celebrating, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo since 1980. We work to expand and extend landmark and zoning protections and stop inappropriate development while also encouraging appropriate development in our neighborhoods. We host roughly 75 programs a year, all of which are now virtual and most of which are free and open to the public. Our events are meant to illuminate the cultural and architectural and medical heritage, history and depth and the value of preservation in our communities. We are a nonprofit membership-based organization, so your involvement and support mean the world to us. You can learn more at villagepreservation.org and please consider becoming a member or making a donation if you're able at villagepreservation.org slash donate. And we call our home the village, but it is also unceded traditional land of the Lenape and Muncie people. I want to acknowledge in this archival recording, the Lenape and Muncie communities and especially their elders past and present and express gratitude for their stewardship of this land, for contributing to its geography and for the use of their language as place names. If you'd like to find out more about this, please reach out, I'm glad to offer resources. Okay, so just a little bit of Zoom protocol before we get started. Please feel free to use the chat to say hi, tell us where you're joining from or raise any thoughts or issues. I'll be here the whole time, um, even if I'm not visible. If you have questions specifically for our speakers, however, uh, I ask that you please use the Q&A function. It just helps me to keep track of your questions. Um, you can submit those at any point during the evening and we'll get to as many of those as possible. Well, I am so very pleased tonight to be joined by all of our amazing speakers for this evening, Janice P. Nomura, Jill Plattner, and partners from our wonderful co-host for this evening, the American Women's Medical Association, Dr. Nicole Sandu, uh, Eliza Chin, and Dr. Vivian Pin. So our first speaker for the evening is Janice. P. Nomura. Janice received a Public Scholar Award from the National Endowment for the Humanities in support of her work on the Doctors Blackwell, which has been on the New York Times bestseller list since its recent publication. Her previous book, Daughters of the Samurai, A Journey from East to West and Back, was a New York Times notable book in 2015. Janice's essays and book reviews have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, Smithsonian, The Rumpus, Lit Hub, and many other publications. So welcome everyone and Janice, please take us away. Thank you so much, Arielle. I really appreciate it. And I'm, it's such an exciting group tonight. I, I, I'm just thrilled to be here with all these powerful women. I'm gonna share my screen so we can get some pictures going. Um, here we go. Um, so, I'm, my job is to introduce the, the Blackwells um, and, the, and their story, for those of you who aren't totally familiar or haven't had a chance to read the whole book yet. Um, let's see, Elizabeth and Emily. If you've heard of them at all, um, you've probably heard of Elizabeth, um, and her name is quickly followed by the phrase, first woman doctor. She was the first woman in America to receive a medical diploma in 1849. Her sister, Emily, on the right there, followed her to become the third woman in America to receive a medical degree in 1854. And together they founded the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children, and then the Women's Medical College of the New York Infirmary. I encountered the Blackwell story for the first time five years ago. This, despite the fact that I had grown up, was born and raised in New York City where they practiced, uh, I had gone to a proudly feminist all girls school since the age of five. I was the math science kid. I graduated with the intention of pursuing medicine, which I did not follow through on, um, but I couldn't believe that I hadn't heard of them. Um, when I started investigating a little further, I discovered that the Blackwell story tends to be easiest to find on the children's biography shelf. Most people who have heard of them say, oh yeah, I had a book about them when I was six. Um, they often look like this an inspirational tale for girls featuring a, um, a well-dressed, slim, elegant young woman with a stethoscope bending solicitously over a grateful patient. Um, 
they, this is from the 40s chapter book for girls. This is the modern middle grade version. This was in my daughter's school library. Um, again, the stethoscope, the, the nice clothes. Uh, this is the, the children's book variety. The stethoscope is still there waiting for her to be taking it up. Um, and it's always just Elizabeth. It's never Emily, her sister. The Blackwells looked like this. And they were never photographed holding stethoscopes. And even if they had been in the 1840s and 50s, um, when they were the age of those young women in the pictures, stethoscopes would have looked like this. <laughs> so there was so much inaccuracy in these children's books. They, they felt very sanitized to me, um, especially when I started diving into the archives and meeting Elizabeth and Emily as they were on the page in their own letters, in their own journals. Um, they're complicated women. Um, they have internal contradictions. They weren't always nice. They were incredibly impressive. Um, and I wanted to know their whole story and not just what fits in a picture book. So what is that story briefly? Whoops, that is not the right picture. Um, the sisters were born in Bristol, England and came to America as children in 1832. They were two of nine siblings. Uh, Elizabeth was voraciously brilliant, socially quite awkward, blessed with a healthy sense of self-worth. She chose medicine not because she was called to heal people. She kind of thought that sickness was a sign of weakness and that bodily functions were disgusting. Um, but she wanted to prove a point about what women could do. She had read her Margaret Fuller and who had, who had written that um, humanity was not gonna rise to a new level of enlightenment until women proved what they could do. Um, Margaret Fuller had written that women could be anything they wanted to be. And Elizabeth chose medicine strategically as a really good way to prove that point. Um, if she went to a medical school and sat through all the lectures and passed the examinations, who could say that she wasn't qualified as any man to be a doctor? So she wrestled a medical degree from the male establishment in 1849 um, and she recruited her sister, Emily, um, to follow her, knowing that the path she had chosen was going to be lonely and difficult. Um, Emily had at least as much trouble wrestling her own medical degree from an institution. I noticed in the chat just now that we have someone with us tonight from Case Western, and that is the place that eventually granted Emily her degree, so welcome. Um, and then both sisters went off to Europe to pursue practical training because medical school in those days didn't give you any. Um, they together studied in London, Paris, and Edinburgh at various times, and really um, came to be quite accomplished as medical practitioners, even though the world tended still to view them more like this. This is a cartoon from the London satirical newspaper Punch uh, toward the end of Emily Blackwell's time in Edinburgh, showing what is supposed to be Emily wearing the scandalous costume of the women's rights movement, bloomers, um, the rather mannish profile and a ridiculous hat peering through spectacles at the only patient who would consult a woman doctor, a lap dog being clutched in the arms of a more conventionally fashionable and feminine young lady. Um, this was the kind of snark that came, they came in for. Most people thought women doctors were ridiculous and unless you could say that they would be better at taking care of their husbands and children. Um, Together, um, the two sisters reconvened in New York City where they founded the um, New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children in 1857 in this building that you're about to hear much more about. Um, it was the first um, hospital staffed by women and its purpose was not just to provide indigent women with a place to receive care from women doctors, but also as a place for the slowly growing numbers of female medical graduates to find some practical training without having to go all the way to Europe. Um, after the Civil War, the sisters added to this institution their own female medical college, um, which had a degree of rigor that was higher than the programs they themselves had attended with men. Uh, and that was just their professional lives. Personally, they were equally interesting. Both sisters adopted daughters. Emily Blackwell spent the last several decades of her life with a female partner. Uh, Elizabeth Cushier, a fellow surgeon. Two of their brothers were two of the first feminist husbands. They married two of the most prominent women's rights advocates of the day, Lucy Stone, who was a suffrage advocate, and Antoinette Brown, who was uh, the first woman in this country to be ordained as a minister. 
Uh, and Elizabeth and Emily didn't agree with their sisters-in-law about women's rights. This is a part of how the story gets complicated. Um, even though they were pioneering women themselves, they found themselves often out of step with the women's movement and often had a rather dim view of women in general, something that I think many women recognize as a is a, a lasting component of modern life, unfortunately. Um, they disagreed with each other about the role of women as doctors. Uh, Elizabeth pursued more public health and Emily became um, a, a really uh, accomplished surgeon, obstetrician and medical professor. Um, they spent the last 40 years of their lives on separate continents. After they founded their institutions together, Elizabeth went back to England and Emily ran the college and the infirmary for the rest of her life. Um, they, this is a really good moment for their story. I think the Blackwells were not perky and pretty like those children's books. They were not interested in pleasing anyone. They were complicated and imperfect and very real heroines, the kind of women who change the world, even though their story does not fit on a plaque. And this is the plaque that is affixed to the infirmary building. That's me and Jane Carey Blackwell Bloomfield, um, one of Elizabeth and Emily's great, great nieces who was there that day when the plaque was put up. And now, I would love to unshare my screen and introduce Dr. Nicole, um, sorry, <laughs> Dr. Nicole Sandu, who is the president of the American Medical Women's Association and associate professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. She's coming to us in New York from someplace even colder um, where she specializes in breast health and breast cancer. Welcome Dr. Sandu. Thank you so much, Janice. I really appreciate it. And what a wonderful slideshow and introduction. Well, it is really uh, my pleasure to be here with everyone this evening. Thank you. The American Medical Women's Association is just delighted to help organize this event in honor of Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell's 200th anniversary year. EMWA's mission is to advance women in medicine, advocate for equity, and ensure excellence in healthcare. And although both Blackwell sisters had passed before the founding of AMWA in 1915, Many physicians in the early generations who followed them were leaders within AMWA. And I see that many AMWA leaders are with us today. Pardon me, my daughter's trying to reach me, I'm so sorry. In 1949, 100 years after Dr. Blackwell became the first woman to graduate from a US medical school, women in medicine across the country were celebrating this momentous centenary. AMWA president, Dr. Elise L'Esperance proposed that AMWA establish a new award, the Elizabeth Blackwell Medal to honor the trailblazing women physician who had made the most outstanding contribution to the cause of women in the field of medicine. Since that time, over 75 women have been honored with the Elizabeth Blackwell Medal, AMWA's highest award. This year, in honor of the 200th birth anniversary of Dr. Blackwell, we're taking the opportunity to honor this distinguished group of women. Their legacies, both past and present, present pardon me, have paved the way for future generations of women physicians. They, like Dr. Blackwell, have helped open doors for women in medicine around the country and around the world. AMWA will be launching a virtual exhibit later this year to share their inspiring stories. I'd like to introduce Dr. Eliza Chin, AMWA's executive director, who contributed to creating the film you're about to see. She's an avid historian of women in medicine, and in my opinion, is the lifeblood of AMWA. So Ariel, if you would like to go ahead and run the film, that would be wonderful. And I'm just going to show. Yes, books. please, please do, Eliza. This is the um, Elizabeth Blackwell book, and um, this is a book about Lucy Stone, written by um, her niece Alice Stone Blackwell. That's it. Thank you, Eliza. I appreciate that.
Well, what an incredible group of women. Next month at the Amwell Leeds virtual meeting, which is at the end of March, we'll be awarding the 2021 Elizabeth Blackwell Medal to Dr. Susan Hingle, whose uh, picture was shown last on that wonderful film. Dr. Hingle is the Associate Dean for Human and Organizational Potential and the Director of Faculty Development at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. And we invite all of you to attend that meeting. Well, tonight I have the incredible honor of introducing Dr. Vivian Penn, the recipient of the Amwell Blackwell Medal in 1995. Dr. Penn was the first full-time director of the Office of Research on Women's Health at the National Institutes of Health, a position that she held for two decades. Prior to that, she was the chair of the Department of Pathology at Howard University College of Medicine and assistant dean of student affairs at Tufts University School of Medicine. Through the Office of Research on Women's Health, Dr. Penn led NIH efforts to implement and monitor the inclusion of women and underrepresented communities in NIH-funded clinical research, and she co-chaired the NIH Working Group on Women in Biomedical Careers. Dr. Penn was the second woman president of the National Medical Association, and she's received numerous honors during her illustrious career, including the Athena Award, the Tufts University School of Medicine Dean's Medal, Honorary Fellow of the New York Academy of Medicine, the Academy Medal for Distinguished Contributions in Health Policy, and a special recognition award from the Association of American Medical Colleges. Dr. Pinn is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and was elected to the Institute of Medicine in 1995, a very high honor. She has received 11 honorary degrees of laws and science since 1992. Her alma mater, the University of Virginia School of Medicine, has named one of its four advisory colleges, the Vivian Pinn College of UVA. Tufts University established the Vivian W. Penn Office of Student Affairs and a scholarship fund in her name. It is truly an honor to have Dr. Penn with us today for this wonderful event. Thank you, Dr. Sanhu, and I'm honored to be part of this group and to be able to celebrate both the book uh, and the information there, as well as AMWA's progress, as well as all the women who have been honored with the Blackwell Award just seeing the cascade of photos, <coughs> excuse me, just seeing the cascade of photos brings back such memories because there's such superstars in that group. So many women who have just been outstanding and who have been mentors to me and to so many other women who have come along before me and after me. But we're really talking about Elizabeth Blackwell today and actually Elizabeth and her sister, Emily. So I have to comment because uh, as you heard Janice say, not everybody had heard of Elizabeth Blackwell, but I think most women in medicine, there's always a program for Women's, Women in Medicine Month or Women's History Month. And someone talks about the first woman to get an MD degree in the United States. And I can remember doing a number of talks and what I looked up and learned about her was that how she was accepted and finally, when no other medical school would take her, she was accepted at Geneva Medical College, sort of on a whim because schools were not taking women. They didn't think women belonged in medicine then. And when she applied there, the faculty didn't want to be blamed. So they asked the students in the class, um, they told the class, well, who were all young men, of course, and told them that this woman had applied and if they agreed, they would take her in thinking surely these boisterous young men in medical school would not want a woman. And so they were surprised because the class decided this would be a fun thing to do. And so they all voted to admit her except for one. And I got this from Janice's book. And there was one who said nay, and the guys got all over him. And so they had a unanimous decision to take her. So it was sort of a, a flake of, of a joke that she got accepted and became the first woman in the United States to receive a medical degree. We often talk about standing on the shoulders of pioneers and those that came before us. But I have to say those were some strong shoulders that those of us who are in medicine or who want to be in medicine have really had to stand on. What a pioneer. I could relate a little bit because when I went to medical school, which was about 120 years after Elizabeth started in medical school, I was the only woman and the only person of color in my medical school class. I know what a challenge that was for me. So I just can't imagine back in the 1800s being the only woman at a time when no one thought women belonged in medicine at all. 
So jumping ahead and just in the few minutes I have, I was sort of asked to think about what would she think about women in medicine today? So let's assume that she was on the Zoom. Elizabeth, and I'm going to focus more on Elizabeth because I've learned more about her sister through the new book, and I've learned a lot about her, and Janice has told you a bit about her. But let's focus on Elizabeth as the first woman. Suppose she were joining this Zoom. What would she think about women in medicine today? Well, one thing I have to give her credit for, she did not suffer from the imposter syndrome. And for those who don't know what the imposter syndrome is, those that we see too often, even today in women, especially in medicine, who have given the opportunity to assume a position or to take on a responsibility question, can I really do that? It's more common in women than in men, and we've got to help women get over that. But I must say that Elizabeth Blackwell felt she had the ability and the wisdom, the knowledge to do whatever men could do. So she did not suffer from the imposter syndrome. Not if everything I read in this book is true and what we know about her. And in a, in a way, having that degree of self-confidence, I'm sure is what helped her to get through her medical education at that time and all the other challenges that she faced during her career. I have to reflect on one other little interesting tidbit that I had to think about in your book. I think it's page 48, 49. Mm -hmm. You described when um, the professor was going to do a lecture on the male, uh, male anatomy, the male, male or reproductive organs, and suggested that she should not be there. But she sat down and told him that she was going to be there and learn about it, and that changed the class. Well. Let's look at 120 years later. When I was in medical school in my anatomy class, one day I overslept and I was late getting to class. And when I came in the back door, the anatomy professor said, Miss Penn, I'm glad you were late today. And it turned out he had done the male genitalia lecture that day. I was not there. So obviously they had the typical old lecture with the guys guffawing and the way they used to prevent, present those lectures when no women were in the class. I guess I should have been flattered that he might have thought he needed to do it differently if I was there. I think she would be surprised and hopefully pleased to see so many women in medicine today, how women have increased and the opportunities that women have in medicine, which did not always exist. She broke the, she broke the, the ceiling to get women admitted into medicine but over this past 200 plus years, getting into medicine did not always provide women the opportunities to do what we felt we were capable of doing or have the opportunities to actually achieve. And we have seen over these past years, especially over the past, I say since about 1970, when we began to see an increase in women going into medicine uh, because there were just very few before that time that now doors are beginning to open to specialties and to opportunities that did not exist before. She wasn't particularly empathetic to women, but it was great that she wanted women to have the opportunity to achieve. And she felt that women could be just as good as men. And she felt that with her new school, her medical school, that she wanted to show that women should have at least as good, if not a better, more strict, more rigid medical education. So we have to thank her for recognizing and putting into place the thought that in fact, women can handle a strict academic uh, regimen. And I think if she were to see today the classes, medical school classes, seeing, seeing the, the courses and how women are achieving, I think she would be delighted. And I really wish that we could have her here just to reflect on what I've reflected on, thinking those are some of the things that she would be excited about. But I have to thank Janice for doing this book because other than knowing about what happened when she was admitted to medical school and that she was the first woman, seeing the many challenges that she had over her career and that she and her sister working together and then working apart, what they were able to accomplish really has opened the doors for us today in the 21st century. So thank you for bringing that information to us, Janice, and to all the women who are on this call. If you're in medicine 
or you're just supportive of women in medicine, I think we do owe a debt of gratitude to her, to both Janice for the book, but to Elizabeth and to Emily. And one last thing, remembering that when I was finishing medical school, very few institutions were offering internships to women in surgery. And yet her sister, Emily, was a surgeon back in those days. Something happened in between because the men kind of put women out of surgery. But now we see women and we know the GYN and pediatrics are the two areas in which we see more women physicians, especially in academic medicine. So I'm delighted to be with you today. Thanks to AMWA uh, for allowing me to give a few thoughts. I apologize for my voice. I've been in meetings all day. I think I talked my voice out, but I have to also add that I like all those women in that video. We are all so proud of having been honored with the Blackwell Award. So thank you to Emma and to thank and thank you to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Penn. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Pin, and to, to everyone at AMWA. So I am delighted to move us along in our evening and introduce you all to Jill Plattner. Jill is a graduate of the Parsons School of Design, a native of Maine and rural Massachusetts, and is a sculptor and designer of striking sculptural jewelry. She opened her eponymous Soho shop in 1998, and her designs have been worn by the likes of Cindy Sherman, Gloria Steinem, and Hillary Clinton. Plattner's large format work has appeared in exhibitions as well as indoor and outdoor site-specific commissions over the past decade. Um, she is the owner of the building at 58 Bleecker Street at Cos Crosby Street that was the New York Infirmary for Women and Children. Um, and Jill is here with us as a very special treat to give us a peek into her work and into the building. So thanks, Jill, for being here with us. Thank you. And what an honor to be here with everyone, with all these incredible women. Thank you for inviting me. So um, this is a mural of the building. Uh, which I believe is still in the downtown hospital. And um, I've had my studio in this building for many years and it really, it wasn't until I would say about 15 years ago that I was very curious as to what had come before me here because there's always been quite a feeling in this building of uh, just, uh, just a very, you can feel history here. So it's like, what, what happened here? And a friend of mine, myself, we, we started digging in the New York City history and discovered that it was built in 1823 for FDR's great grandfather. And then in 1857, Elizabeth Blackwell opened up her, the infirmary with her sister Emily, which wasn't written in the, the history that I only learned from Janice. <laughs> But uh, so when I found this out 15 years ago, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm walking on the same, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm here in this space where so much has happened and it's so important. And I, I was incredibly inspired. And uh, so anyway, that's, that's sort of the beginning of the story. The, uh, the building, it's obviously, it's an old building, 200 years old. It was in really rough shape, uh, needed a lot of attention. It hadn't had any, any maintenance or uh, it was, it was uh, just, you know, old buildings need a lot. So things were falling apart to put it, to put it mildly. So we started doing, uh, we started taking on some of the very serious repairs a couple of years ago. What Janice just showed was a couple, a picture of before and a picture. Yeah, this is, you can see like all the bricks are kind of bulging out and it needed a lot of pointing and the roof was collapsing. And, uh, and then after we can, you can see it's like, ding! <laughs> you can, it's, it's uh, cleaning it up and, uh, and giving it love. So, so uh, 
Oh, okay. Let's see. Here we are. Here we go. <laughs> Janice is moving the pictures along for me because I'm a little technologically challenged. So, but after I discovered the history in the building, I created a collection of jewelry that I called Blackwell. And this particular piece is called Blackwell. And um, it, for me, it was, it's one of my most important collections in my whole career because it, it, it just, whatever happened on the, uh, it, it, uh, it was a, uh, it, 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 there, I, I developed a technique that, that changed the way things moved in the pieces. And this is called Crosby, which was shot on the cobblestones of Crosby Street. And, and the pieces really feel like chain mail. This is called Wish. And a lot of the pieces, anyway, it was, it was a very, very important moment for me to, uh, to uh, feel this and create something from it and uh, feel, uh, understand my connection with my studio and, so, um, and oh, so moving on, <laughs> and then in, uh, in 2018, the Greenwich Village Historical Society uh, emailed me and asking, like, would you be interested in putting a plaque on the building? And I was like, oh my God, are you kidding me? Like I, since I discovered the history, I was, I was like, how come no one knows about this woman? And how, why, why do I not know about her? Why didn't I learn about her? So I was like over the moon that, that someone else wanted to, <laughs> oh, here's some more pictures of the, the building and the restoration construction. This, uh, we had to replace the roof a couple of years ago because it's very rotten. That is sunlight. We had to literally rip the entire roof off. And, uh, and you can see the rot in the roof um very intense <laughs> this is the the peak of the building where the bricks literally could be removed by hand because they didn't have any mortar they they just had literally like sand <laughs> between you could just pick them up and you're like hey so maybe we should um you know maybe we need to put a little concrete in between those bricks <laughs> Okay, so we we uh, we had scaffolding on the building for a couple of years, which is always really rough. But I I took some advantage of the scaffolding and did some work on my sculptures outside on the scaffolding. I did some finishing work out there, which was fun. Uh, there, this picture is of the subfloors of one of the floors in the building and we we pulled up these gross floors that were on top of this and this these beautiful floors were shown and we're like oh my god what what are we going to do they're so beautiful they're in very rough shape so um i i have a yeah i have a friend who has a mill and he said he would remill them and we remilled the wood and that's the same flooring we that that he took out he we pulled out the boards they picked up the boards and then they milled the boards they delivered the boards back and here they are we reinstalled them in the building so they're having their second life here which is really amazing here's some before and after pictures too this is of one of the floors in the building this is uh two years ago this shot they're the very um bad shape like the ceilings were were falling down and the, the floor was there were a lot of holes in the floor and it just uh, not not great and then then we have a little after and now here it is same floor wow so that's it it's uh, i'm i'm honored to to uh, be able to work here and have a wonderful crew of uh, mostly women here that are also completely honored to work here and uh walk in the footsteps of the history and uh, we'll do anything we can to, to forward this, and keep, keep it moving. <laughs>
the part of our evening that is the Q&A part. So we've got, we've got one question, but for the, for the folks who are here with us, please, please feel, feel free. Um, this is a question for you, Janice, from Michelle um, about how old Emily and Elizabeth were when they received their degrees. So Elizabeth was 26, and I believe that Emily was also 26 because they were five years apart and they got their degrees five years apart. So slightly more mature than their male classmates um, who quickly came to regard them as older sisters and realized that if they uh, did their homework next to the Blackwell sisters, they would probably do better. Um, yeah, so uh, 26, by the time they had scraped together enough money to pay their tuition. Thanks. All right. Um, also, a question from, from Maureen for you again, Janice. Um, how did you select this book topic? How did you come to the Blackwell? Um, to, to do this kind of work, this kind of research and writing, um, you have, it, it, it takes so long that you really have to be in love. And um, I've, in my case, you have to feel a personal connection to the material. My first book was about Japan. I, I have a deep personal connection to Japan through my family. Um, in this case, when I looked back inside myself, like, okay, wh where's the next book gonna come from? Um, the, the connection was, was pre-med me from 1989, it turned out. Um, I, I had really fully intended to study medicine when I got to college and then I was seduced by the English department. Um, today, we prob I probably might, I might've done both, but back then it didn't seem like both was possible. Um, uh, and it was an ecstatic joy to come back and, and kind of access my early interest in medicine through storytelling and history, um, especially as my own daughter pursues her pre-medical studies in college, um, there was, a, there was a, a coming home feeling about it. Um, yeah. And, and also I couldn't believe that I'd never heard of them. And it, it struck me that if I hadn't heard of them given my background, then there were probably other people who, who would need to know this story for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Jill, we have a couple of questions for you. Um, okay, let's see. We have questions from Laura and Oren that I'm going to sort of mush together. Um, where are you at in the restoration? How many rooms are in the building? And also, was there any? Were there um, any crumbs left in the building from? from its various previous lives that, that were illuminated to you? Um, <laughs> the only crumbs that I found were um, a bottle in the wall, which is very beautiful and now has a, a plant growing in it, mm. <laughs> and um, a piece of coal. There were a lot of, uh, we, we would, you know, take down or, or you know, that take down a portion of a wall to make sure that everything is stable behind it and and then see like, oh my gosh, there was a chimney there and and wow, there was a fire here and and uh, just constantly <laughs> things that, that you would find that were uh, pretty exciting. <laughs> Um, we are, we're very close with the restoration where we're like, I would say 90% done in, in, uh, in getting, getting this place up to speed, but it, it's, it takes, it takes a lot of love and a lot of time and, um, and energy and, and great people to work with great people. So, and we have, we have that, so we're very lucky. And if I could add, since Jill is too modest to say it herself, the, 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 this building is becoming a hub of, of women-owned business and, and, um, and there's still more room in it for more of that. And it, it, as an inspirational spot, um, the energy on that corner and Bleecker and Crosby, I think Elizabeth and Emily would be very proud of it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's all because of Jill's vision for what this building could be. And it's, it's your studio space, right, Jill? Yes. Yeah, that's so, that's so great. Um, 
Can you, we have a question from Vicki. Can you tell us a little bit about your Blackwell collections? How many pieces you created for that? What it's like? Um, it, there, I don't know, there's, there's probably about 30 pieces and it's, this is, this is one of them that I just wear all the time. And, uh, it's, it's very, oh yeah, that's one. Janice has one on called Wish. <laughs> they're, they're, um, they're, they, they have a very chain mail sense of them and they, they have incredible movement to them that is, is like none of the other collections. I mean, all, all of my work has a lot of movement, but, but this one in particular was the start of this, this type of movement. And all of the names in the collection have, are, are very, uh, you know, they, they just, they speak of, of uh, what I felt when I discovered the history, like Wish and Dream and Cosby. Blackwell and all these, all these like inspirational names and thoughts and like anything is possible. Let's do it. <laughs> oh. oh, great. Thanks. Um, whew, okay. Um, I'm going to, let's see. Ah, and Jill, I'm, I'm guessing that the, the house is not in its current state open to the public? No, it's not. The, okay. the ground floor is. Oh, great, okay. Yeah, the ground floor is actually my store, my retail store. Oh, right. there you go. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah, so you can come on in and see the Blackwell collection right there. <laughs> <laughs> go on over everybody. Maybe one at a time in the pandemic though. One at a time, <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Pin, we have a couple of questions for you. Um, Maureen wants to know, what was your medical specialty and what are you doing now? And Gloria wants to know, what do you think is the next hurdle that should be addressed by forward thinking women in medicine? Um, last one's tough. Um, I actually trained in pathology. I'm actually an immunopathologist. Um, most people don't realize that because when I went in NIH and spent 20 years in women's health, most assumed that I was a gynecologist. But actually, I think when you're in pathology, you learn a little bit about almost every field, maybe not a whole lot about any, but a little bit about every field. And I think having that broad background helped me a lot with looking at a broad research agenda for for women's health. So, uh, and since I retired, so I had a double career, about 25 years in pathology and over 20 years in women's health and women's health research. And what am I doing now? I've supposedly been retired since 2011 and I still haven't had time to get to the grocery store or <laughs> clean my house because I seem to be doing just what I was doing before I retired, which is in meetings, giving talks, and working with women and groups on many issues uh, and spending a lot of time with the National Medical Association and doing a lot of the things that I was doing before and that my, my different areas have brought me about. And I must say, I'm very pleased because pathology has welcomed me back into the area after being out of pathology for over 20 years. So I'm now doing a bit with working with those who are in the field of pathology today. So. Uh, Gloria Bachman, I'm sure that came from you, that question about what is the next hurdle. I think we still have a way for women to go in getting accepted in so many areas. We see, especially, and as you, I think most of you know, my focus really has been in academic medicine um, and looking for both women and those who are from underrepresented groups. We've, we've noted the increase in women in fields of medicine and entering and graduating from medical school, but we still don't see women, parity for women in leadership roles, not just deans of medical school. And you've got a, several medical school deans like Marjorie Jenkins and others who are on this. Uh, and we've seen an increase, but nowhere near parity and certainly not even in the full professor role or as CEOs or as the top person in, in industry. And so what we still, I think one of our greatest challenges today 
is really being able to move with some parity into leadership roles, because I think serving in leadership roles, we can bring some other dimensions. And I think we'd probably be a little more generous uh, with our, our mentoring in general and our opening doors for others. That's mm -hmm. about as brief as I think I can be. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, we have a few questions also for um, any, anyone from EMWA who, who feels like answering. Um, a question from Lynn, how is the recipient of the Blackwell Medal chosen? Um, and Maureen is curious about this year's Blackwell awardee. I'll let Eliza take the question. If that's okay with you, Eliza. <laughs> That's fine. Um, so to answer the second one first, um, uh, come to the AMWA meeting. Um, there's a <laughs> link on our website. It is virtual. You don't have to travel. And Dr. Sue Hingle will be receiving the award at this upcoming meeting. Um, how are the recipients chosen? We have an awards committee that meets every year. The Blackwell Award is very competitive. It's our top award. Um, and every year, I have to say, it's a very hard decision for the award committee. Um, to pick just one person. Um, the award, when it first started, I think was limited to AMWA members. So a lot of our past presidents are some of the early recipients that you saw. Um, and I can't remember what year it was, um, then it opened up to non-members and members. And so um, really, as we looked into the stories of these women, um, amazing stories from women who um, helped um, hide uh, and rescue Jews in World War II during the Holocaust, to um, you know, women in all leaders of, um, leaders in all different parts of uh, healthcare sectors, um, pretty amazing stories. And part of the creation of the film is the start uh, of an exhibit that we're gonna have online with everyone's story and history. And we've been doing a lot of research, tracking down some families. I've been getting a lot of emails. So there's gonna be some fascinating stories coming out of this. So stay posted and we'll have this all on our website in the coming year. Thank you. Thanks. And um, everyone, I just, I just put the link to AMWA's website into the chat along with um, Jill's website and the link to purchase Janice's book. Um, I've, been, I've been sneaking a little peek at Jill's uh, jewelry, the Blackwell collection. It's stunning. <laughs> Just so beautiful. Stunning. Aw, thank you. I was looking at it earlier. Um, let's see. We have a lot of questions about the Blackwells. Um, Karen wants to know who funded the free care that they offered at their clinic. Donors, for the most part. Um, the, the women, the, the, the well-heeled, mostly Quaker and free-thinking women who uh, supported the idea of women doctors weren't always interested in consulting women doctors, which was an interesting wrinkle, um, but they were useful in, in getting money together, um, both to support the infirmary and the Women's Medical College. Hey, all right, here we go. Uh, what did Elizabeth do during the Civil War? Were there women on the front lines? What about doctors during World War I? Were there women women doctors who were active then? That's from Margaret. Uh, nurses, certainly. Uh, Elizabeth and Emily, um, their role during the Civil War was interesting. Uh, as soon as it began, they called a meeting at the infirmary uh, of their supporters, those donors, um, and drafted an appeal that ran in the New York Times saying, okay, women, uh, if you're interested in supporting a union cause, come to the Cooper Union, which still stands down in Cooper Square, um, and we'll have a meeting and we'll figure things out because there was all this chaotic energy and that, that wasn't particularly useful. Um, after that appeal, thousands of women converged on Cooper Union. And out of that um, incredibly large meeting grew something called the Women's Central Association of Relief. And out of that grew uh, the US Sanitary Commission, which was the largest civilian organization of the war. Um, you can draw a straight line from uh, Elizabeth and Emily's meeting to the US Sanitary, US Sanitary Commission, if you like. Um, the Blackwell sisters were put in charge of uh, identifying 
and training women to become nurses at the front, uh, which they spent a year doing, but they quickly ran into some really frustrating pushback from the male physicians in the city, in New York, um, who weren't interested in working alongside women physicians as colleagues. Um, it was one thing to, you know, uh, to applaud the idea of a woman in medicine, but when you actually had to work alongside her, that was a different matter. So things like their infirmary was excluded from the list of hospitals that was training nurses to go to the front. And that was so frustrating that eventually Elizabeth and Emily withdrew their support from the US mm -hmm. Sanitary Commission. They were especially annoyed that somebody like Dorothea Dix had been put in charge in Washington she wasn't a physician at all. They called her the meddler in chief. Um, and they withdrew their support from the war and eventually turned their attention toward their next project, which was founding their college. It's a it's a interesting, complicated story. It sounds it. People will have to read the books. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Oh, so great. Okay. Um, <laughs> can you speak about the challenge that Elizabeth experienced in losing her sight and how that impacted her career? Yeah, that's a that's good story. From Luann. Um, so, uh, Elizabeth, sorry? That's from Luann. Thanks, Luann. Okay. Elizabeth um, went to Paris to do practical training and she committed herself to um, several months at a public maternity hospital called La Maternité, which trained young women from all over France to be midwives. Now she was already a doctor, but uh, she knew that she would get a lot of experience with obstetric cases in this hospital. Um, now, if you were giving birth in a hospital in 1850, you were destitute if anyone with any money at all would give birth at home. So the clientele of, of laboring mothers at this hospital um, were you know, really in, in bad shape. Uh, at the ends of their ropes, and a lot of them were prostitutes, and a lot of them were infected with venereal diseases, including gonorrhea. And when a baby is born to a woman with gonorrhea, um, passing through the birth canal, they often contract something called gonorrheal conjunctivitis, which is a eye infection. Uh, Elizabeth was tending to one of these infected infants and washing their eye when some of the washing liquid splashed into her face and she contracted gonorrheal conjunctivitis, um, which today, while not a joke, uh, is not a big deal in the age of antibiotics, uh, then it was it was a catastrophe. Um, and she eventually lost one eye and wore a glass prosthetic from the age of 27 on, um, something she never spoke about. A lot of people never even knew she had only one eye, but it did prevent her from pursuing surgery. And it even made reading hard sometimes. Um, it, that to me is one of the, the, the most obvious ways in which Elizabeth Blackwell is a, is a, is a, it's a, is more of an Amazon than any woman you will ever encounter because she did not go home to recover. She went on to London to continue training with one eye. Um, I, I, I don't know too many women who have that kind of fortitude. <laughs> um, so uh, she, it, it did orient her, I think, more and more toward public health and policy rather than practice because it was something mm -hmm. she, could, she could write and speak more often, more easily than she could do practice, which would require um, more precise vision. Yeah, we, we had a couple of questions about um, the Blackwell sisters seeing patients versus having leadership roles. Um, did, did, they, did they treat patients? Did they treat just women and children or also men? Um, yeah, no, no, they weren't treating men. Um, women were not treating men. Um, I, I, maybe Dr. Penn has a better sense of when women started to treat men um, outside of war contexts. Um, I don't have um, a, a clear sense. I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure. I know that, uh, um, that when I was in med school and there may be some others who came along when I did, um, and no one ever taught me, and I told you I missed that lecture, and no one ever taught me the, the male reproductive physical exam because the guys, that was before you had simulators or simulations or models, and the, the guy medical students could, could practice or learn about anatomy on each other. And they, I said, absolutely no one was learning female anatomy on me, but they thought that because we had one older guy in the class, it would be all right for him 
said, absolutely not, but they were not going to let me see him. I could tell you some interesting stories about how with patients, I did learn the male reproductive anatomy, but I won't take your time now, uh, <laughs> but some interesting stories. But it was a while, but I, I wanted to go back to the question though, because I thought it was very interesting, the observation that 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 Elizabeth and Emily, especially Elizabeth from the book I gather had about women not wanting to expose their bodies to male physicians. So I can really address that a little more. And I wanna point out to people that this is not just ancient history. It was really around 1990 when we really began to have the push to get women to pay attention and do self-exams for breast cancer. And you realize that even in the early 90s, many women were not going to male physicians. So they were not getting a breast exam because they did not want to show their breasts to male physicians. And actually for many women, their husbands did not want them showing their breasts to male physicians. And we know of examples in, of in other countries where even as recently as, as it, it, at the turn of the century, uh, some of the countries that in the, I won't say the far East, but, but in other areas where the rates for breast cancer mortality were really high because the same thing, mm -hmm. women did not want to show their breasts to male physicians. So we've seen, I can't say when that all switched, but that has really been one of the reasons that it's been good to have more women who are in gynecology or in family practice or in internal medicine uh, that women can feel comfortable. Uh, I think after, the, with all the exposure you see on TV, I'm surprised that so many are, are hesitant about showing their bodies because you can see almost anything on TV these days, but it's <laughs> taken a while to get there and it has had an impact on medicine. Uh, um, these days, I don't hear as much about uh, about uh, about concerns, but it's not unusual, and I'm sure for most of the physicians here, that um, you'll get a call from someone saying, I need a gynecologist, can you refer me to a woman for, gyneco for, for gynecology? So for women today, that has been important. For many years, there were, especially when women could not get surgical internships, you didn't see that many women in OBGYN. And I think there were some instances where women's health suffered because of the modesty of women uh, until we can learn to appreciate the body as being a natural thing and, and for, for healthcare reasons. Uh, and I think that most male physicians, I won't say all, but most male physicians did respect that, that modesty of women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and no, we, and nobody else to go to if there weren't that many women doctors. So you had to go to who there was. So <laughs> yeah, we we have a comment from um, from Jesse about um, you know sort of within that empowering black women doctors, um, and we have a question for you, Doctor Pin, about just sort of the the continued need for diversity um, diversity. Um, in the in in the medical profession. Um, yeah, and this is one instance when I have to bring up another point because I'm all about women's health and women in careers and women being in medical careers. But one thing that not everybody recognizes is that the biggest crisis has been for black males. While while the numbers of of women and the numbers of most underrepresented minorities in medicine have increased, not as much as they should have, but have increased. And we now are seeing women constituting for the most part, more than 50% of entering medical school classes mm. over the past, uh, I think since the late seventies, the number of black males has not increased until about two years ago when there was a recognition that we're seeing fewer and fewer black males in medicine. Um, there is a, a, there is a, uh, a round table at the National Academy of Medicine, Science and Engineering, taking a look at this now really to look for expanding. They can't have me on a committee and have it just be men. So we're looking at increasing numbers of women and men in medicine. But, but we, we, I ha just have to bring attention to the fact that as we've seen increases in all populations, we have not seen an increase in the black males. Women are getting there. And again, we are seeing women coming in the pipeline is increasing, but we're not seeing that pipeline shift as it should to the top leadership positions. And that's 
where we need to stress. Diversity is important. I think someone had a question about diversity. We do want to continue to increase diversity and opportunities. And I think we didn't get in discussions about the pandemic here, uh, but, but I think this pandemic, in fact, I just read where the numbers of underrepresented minorities applying to medical school this year have really spiked. And I think the fact that there's been a tension has really, is, you could not help but notice the despair, health disparities that this uh, pandemic has demonstrated. And it's thought that perhaps because of that, that more of our underrepresented minorities, including women, uh, are applying to medical school because they've sort of gotten the bug, seeing the importance of being able to get the message and inform message into their communities. So I think with, in spite of all the problems and damages from this pandemic, that may be one of the most important things that, I don't wanna to talk too long, but I think there's another important thing pandemic may be doing for women in medicine and women in science. You know, for many years, women have sort of, sort of been hesitant talking about family responsibilities for fear it'll be seen as a stigma. If you're a woman in medicine, you don't want to be seen as, you don't want to say, I have to go get my kids out of childcare for fear your male colleagues will say you're not serious about medicine. But mm. we have now seen that, especially for women, especially with homeschooling where men are contributing, but women are doing the most part, that women in medicine and science have been the most severely affected. And so I have seen calls in like an editorial in Science Magazine, uh, many others, maybe some on this call have even published some of the articles indicating that maybe it's time to recognize that women should not be, not considered a stigma and to own up to the responsibilities they have for family care and maybe that it is time that our federal government or our nation in general give women what is needed to help care for children because the pandemic is really pointing this out. So I think we may see a big shift that I've not seen before away from women feeling they can't speak up about family care to now seeing more attention. And of course, men will benefit also, but concern is about women and those responsibilities. I'll be quiet. These things are just things that are important to me. <laughs> That is amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it of course benefits everyone. Um, <laughs> um, and I, I think it dovetails with another question that we got about the Blackwell sisters and the unusual ways that they created and took care of their own families. Um, we had a, a question about that, Janice. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think it was pretty clear to Elizabeth and Emily that that they could that that they were doing medicine because they weren't interested in marrying and having families. However, both of them adopted daughters um, in very different ways. Um, uh, Elizabeth adopted a daughter early on, I mean, in the, in the 1850s, before she opened the infirmary, basically because she was lonely. Uh, she went to what's now called Randall's Island to the, to the, uh, to the nurseries there and plucked out an, a young Irish orphan about six or seven years old as sort of a strange, uh, com, com, a mixture of servant and daughter who, who remained her companion throughout life. Um, Emily adopted an infant um, later on after she had finished founding the institutions, an infant who grew into a daughter who called her mama and gave her grandchildren um, in, a, in a much more conventional family kind of way. Um, Oh, and, and an aside, so I, I noticed some questions people were asking about, I, I mentioned Randall's Island, people were asking about Blackwell's Island, which is now Roosevelt Island, just mm -hmm. as an aside for those people, um, no relation, alas. <laughs> <laughs> hey. but, uh, that as, far as, as far as taking care of families, Elizabeth and Emily did not. Um, the, their, their, their children were um, uh, not taken care of primarily by them and, and served a slightly different purpose. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. We, we had a question also about birth control and if, that, if access to something like that might have changed their ideas of you know, how to build families or you know, having a career and a family at the same time, th those kinds of challenges. I, 
is it for me? Um, I think I think uh, they the, the Blackwells very much acknowledged that too many children was not a good idea. That that limiting family size was 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 promoting health. Um, Elizabeth's ideas about birth control were um, backward facing. She uh, was not in favor of abortion, and she was not in favor of any kind of mechanical or or medicinal birth control. Um, she believed in a rather, in the idealistic way that you can believe if it's never been your practical experience that women could basically instruct their husbands when it was a good night for sex. And their husbands of course would listen to them and obey them and they could basically control family size by the rhythm method, which was wildly impractical for most women in the real world. Um, Elizabeth Blackwell never really uh, acknowledged the gap between her idealism and practical life. Um, which is interesting. I mean, she was a transitional figure. You know, I think the earliest feminists by modern feminist standards often aren't particularly feminist, um, but yet they were the, the, the path breakers. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and of course, uh, Do Dr. Pan, as you were talking about the pandemic, I was thinking about this question that we got from the Maureen, uh, from Maureen, which I think maybe is is for you, Janice, but um, what did the sisters do during the flu epidemic in the early 20th century? Well, that's an easy one to answer because they died in 1910. There you <laughs> so go. So nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, dodge that one. Um, do, do, do any of any of our other speakers have information about um, women's health during the flu epidemic after the Blackwells died? No, okay, mm -hmm. great. Well, I, I just think, you know, I, while the, the book points out how Elizabeth Blackwell really went more the public health nature and, and while her sister was going more towards clinical practice of medicine. And I was thinking in terms of women's health, remember that, um, that the focus on sanitation, improving quality of water, et cetera, was one of the movements we could almost call a women's health movement back many years ago before the more recent one. And it was in the first that we began to see a, a, an, ex, an increase in life expectancy for both women and men. And part of that was related to the cleaning up and the sanitation and public health. So um, while I would like to think if you're in medicine, I'd be more inclined towards Emily's approach that is practicing medicine but on the other hand, recognizing, especially today, how important public health has become. And I hear from a lot of women who are interested in medicine who say they are now interested in public health aspects more so than actually practice of medicine. So I, I just would add that as a reflection. Janice mm -hmm. has so much in that book. There's so much information in there. And if those of you had not read it, you should, you'd be amazed at so many things that are covered that you can reflect on related to what we are experiencing today. And that was just one of the things that really struck me. So grateful for that. Yeah, so, so incredible. Um, well, we have a lot of other questions and I feel like we could talk all night, but um, <laughs> this, this is a, a a question, I'll, I'll just take a couple more um, before we call it a night. Um, this is for you, Dr. Pin, um, from Vicki who says, uh, while there are fewer black males in medicine, it is interesting that despite their numbers, they're more likely to be promoted to department chair and even vice chancellor. Can you talk about what is needed for black women um, given that given their numbers um, and what they can do to become academic leaders. And that's very true. Uh, and that's probably Vicki Mays, I would think, who raised that and knows the data on that. But it's very true if you look, uh, while we've seen an increase in the numbers of women uh, that in, in medicine and getting into medical school and graduating, it is still true that for underrepresented populations, that more men are promoted into leadership positions than women. So it gets back to the same thing about looking for uh, overcoming the major challenges 
and the major challenges we know for the progress of women are uh, are thought to be not thought to be there. I think data pretty much show that it's related to uh, biases, and we can put in all the phobic biases, but biases uh, to sexual harassment uh, and getting access for opportunities. And it comes down to having those who are in charge, uh, having making sure that they designate the person power and the resources to be able to deal with and overcome these biases that are affecting women in the academic or in the in, in industry or wherever to be able to move into leadership positions. But that is a striking fact and it is true that fewer men and especially for black males, fewer black males going into medicine and graduating, but they still hold more department chairs, deans, and high level positions in women. So we've got to get more women into top positions so they can help put more women into top positions. That's what we need to do. We wanna be fair to the men, but we wanna be fair for women also. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, so I'm gonna, um, well, we, we, did, we did have a question earlier about, um, whether the former New York infirmary building, now um, Jill's shop and studio, um, whether that building is protected. And I, I believe that it is part of the NoHo Historic District. Is that right, Jill? Yes, and it's yeah. landmarked. So, yeah. yeah. So um, that's, that's very, very special and important to us at Village Preservation. Um, and, and of course, so, so much of this is rooted in the village, but um, we got a great, a great question about um, Florence Nightingale and sort of international, um, what is AMWA doing internationally? Um, and what, what, what can all of you tell us about sort of the global women's world of medicine? Anybody? I just want to. <laughs> uh, I can I can probably take that. So I just put something in the in the chat. Um, so Amwa is a, we are um, a sister association um, within the Medical Women's International Association. So we've got sister national associations around the world. And in fact, in 2019, we hosted um, in New York, in Brooklyn, New York, the hundredth um, anniversary of the Medical Women's International Association. Um, when COVID happened, um, you know, shortly after that, um, we reached out to our sister associations to find out what women were doing in their countries. And we hosted a webinar series, uh, One World, wow. One Women, COVID-19, Women Physicians Come Together. And it was really just great to hear how um, everyone was doing it, what tactics they were using, and really learning from each other. Hmm. That's amazing. Is there, is there a way to, to see that? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, we've got some links on our website and maybe in, in a follow up email we can include some of that information. Yeah, um, we've also had a couple of questions about whether we're recording this event, which we are, um, and we always we always send out an email after the fact with a short survey for everyone to fill out about how the event um, went and also as many links as we possibly can so um, and, and also the, the link to the video, which we'll put up on our YouTube page and our website. So um, everybody keep an eye out mm -hmm. for that. Um, hey, Ariel, can I just say one thing? Um, please do. Kind of following up on what Eliza was saying about MWIA, which is a wonderful um, organization. Um, AMWA membership um, leads, you become a member of MWIA as well, and it helps support the um, American Women's Hospital service. Um, which is another wonderful organization. Eliza can speak much better on than I can. I put something in the chat about, someone asked about World War I in the chat. And so the American Women's Hospital Service was um, an outgrowth of that effort during World War I when women weren't allowed to become commissioned officers of the military. And many women refused to become contract surgeons, which was a civilian role and with no benefits. Um, 
and uh, so AMWA, uh, along with one other group, sent all women's units um, abroad to serve in France. And so we've got a short movie on our website. I put that in the chat if you're interested. It's a terrific film. Oh, great. Well, thank you all so, so much. Um, I want to open open this up to, to the five of you if you have anything that you would want to say in closing. Um, no, no pressure. Um, <laughs> but I just, I just want to thank you all so very, very much for being here with us. And um, we will, we will send, we will send lots of information and links. And um, please buy Janice's book. It's fabulous. I really like it. <laughs> um, and Ariel, I think Dr. Gebhardt asked if the chat could be saved because there's some wonderful links and um, ways to communicate with each other in the um, chat. And sure. I just want to say thank you for organizing this. It's been just wonderful to be here with everyone. It's been incredibly inspiring. Just a wonderful event. Thank you so much. Oh, thank and thank you. you to all the attendees. Yeah, thank, thank you all so much. Um, so, some of our chats are private, so it may be a, a shortened transcription of the chat, but I can, I can definitely try to do that in the, in the next day or two. Um, and once the pandemic is over, Jill, you'll probably have a lot of folks coming by <laughs> your studio. <laughs> I noticed a couple of your pieces are sold out. You might need to get working on some more. <laughs> I couldn't get the website. I couldn't copy it out of the, the chat. So that was one reason I wanted the chat so I could get the website. You know what? I actually got to it before it was put up in the chat. All I did was Google Jill's name and Blackwell collection. And oh, it pops okay. right up and it's just a stunning collection. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> An event in the space um, this past March. Um, and unfortunately that got canceled because of COVID. But hopefully we will be back there again. Yay. And people were asking about getting Janice to autograph her book. So, um, right. uh, well, we're gonna ha we're just gonna have to have a party on Crosby Street and Bleecker soon. That's right. Yeah, that's <laughs> like something to plan for. I am. I am I'll all, there. I am all in for that. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you all again so so much. Have a really good evening. Stay safe. Um, take good care. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank Have you for including. It was wonderful. Yes. <laughs>